This is Jerry Amernick. I'm the author of the new book, Babe Ruth, The Superstar's Legacy, which is now available on Amazon at Amazon.com and in both print and as an ebook, and also at the website BabeRuthLegacy.com. This book is unlike any other that's ever been done on Babe Ruth. It's not a biography, but it explores the legacy of Ruth on many different fronts, both in and beyond baseball. It gets into sport, culture, business, the arts, and in no small dose, humanity. Today we kick off the Babe Ruth Legacy interview series where we speak one-on-one -on -one with people who preserve the legacy of Babe Ruth and I'm really pleased that the first person we're going to talk to is Tom Stevens, the grandson of Babe Ruth and the son of Julia Ruth Stevens, daughter of the Babe, who's now 101 years old. Tom, you were kind enough to write the foreword to the book and I want to thank you for that. Welcome to this series. Thanks for having me, Jerry. So, um, you, you've been a, a great help to me in, in doing research, uh, learning more about the family and, and the legacy of the babe. Um, I want to know uh, what it was like growing up, uh, you know, in the shadow of Babe Ruth. You were actually born not long after he passed away, but you have stories from your mother and also from your grandmother, uh, Claire, who was Babe's uh, second wife, and, he, and they were married for a long time. Yes, they got married in uh, 1929 and remained so uh, until his death in, in 1948. So almost uh, almost 20 years. And they were together even or b before that time as well. Yes, right. Several years, but he was uh, having been raised Catholic. Um, he didn't believe in uh, divorce, even though he was estranged from his first wife, who yes. remained in Boston while he went on with his career with the Yankees in New York. She was uh, she was just she was a Boston girl and she was just overwhelmed with here. all the limelight and all the attention and, and New York. So she right. uh, she returned to uh, to Boston and he spent his life by himself. Right. So, you know, one thing led to another and so what was it like for you? I guess as a young boy, you, you, you realized that there was something special here uh, that was unlike uh, other grandfathers. Right. Um, you, may, you said the shadow. I would say the shadow imposed when I played ball. <laughs> okay. In the beginning, um, until they saw that I was not going to hit a home run every time I got up. So. Oh, but uh, they knew that, who you were? <laughs> that quickly went away. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it was, um, boy, it was just, uh, uh, there was nothing but uh, benefits to being, you know, Babe's grandson in, in terms of the opportunities that it afforded me to meet people and to take part in, in uh, ceremonies and uh, observances and things, all, all related to baseball. So it's, uh, it, it was basically, it's enriched... Um, certainly enriched my life and, and that of my family. So you've met a number of people, uh, you mentioned uh, in the world of sport and even politics, uh, media, who are some of the people you've met uh, being the grandson of Babe Ruth? Well, believe it or not, uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Met him in Madison Square Garden in 1999 at the, uh, uh, basically Sports Illustrated was, uh, it was a rec, uh, recognition or looking back over the previous century and the the great athletes and all you know all venues um i sat uh, i sat behind pete sampras and richard petty petty was sitting behind wow me. yeah jim brown was to the right uh we chatted with uh magic johnson uh michael jordan's uh, chauffeur introduced me to michael jordan i mean that was just one yeah one evening. wow that's surprised. pretty good evening <laughs> star-studded event when they reopened Yankee Stadium in 1976 after rehabbing it. Yeah. Uh, I sat next to you, Weeb Eubank, Frank Gifford was across, uh, Joe Lewis was on my other side. Anybody who had anything to do yeah. with Yankee Stadium had been invited to be there. Um, I met uh, Gerald Ford and oh. a number of others at the yeah. 1976 uh, All-Star Game. So, when did you first realize there was something special about about your grandfather? Uh, yeah, I guess you were a young boy. Uh, at what age? Probably, I would say about seven. Yeah. Uh, and I and I mentioned this in in the forward, Jerry. It was when we were uh, invited to be on television, and and uh, the programming in television was very limited. So, to do anything on TV was was a, a pretty big deal. 
Right, and back in the uh, 50s, yeah, yeah. Yes, would have been probably 58 or 59, somewhere around there. Right. So, you were born four years after the babe died, and you never actually knew him yourself, but you've obviously learned a lot about him from your mother, Julia, and from your grandmother, Claire. Claire passed away in 1976, so you certainly have memories of her. Do you remember things that she had told you about her husband, the babe? Oh, she, yes. Um, think, just things in, in passing. And even now, um, Mom will come out with something, with, which I, I guess and she's never brought it up before because I guess she thought it was common knowledge or it didn't occur to her or whatever. Yeah. But in the uh, just stove, uh, a couple of months ago, and I, I, I actually did include this in the forward as well. She mentioned, she said, you know, I used to hold Daddy's feet while he did sit-ups. Oh, no. <laughs> you know that, you know, just little, you know, snippets and family things, and they do, they do come out every, uh, every so often. And just, um, and she's just, she's so appreciative of having been his daughter. Yeah. Um, even now, over the, at over the age of a hundred. Yeah. We were, we were, I mean, Babe always comes up in conversation, and I'm always bringing her uh, up to speed on on what's going on, uh, what sort of things, Luminary, you know, or the licensing company yes. that working on or whatever. And she, she just the, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, she said, you know, he was such a great guy. He, uh, he adopted me, he gave me his name, and, you know, all of, all of that stuff. She's, um, so... Even even now, it's uh, these these things uh, come up, and it was that was same was true when I was with my grandmother uh, grandmother Claire. Um, I'm trying to think of some specifics, and there's just been so many things over the years. It's um, it's difficult to come up with uh, with any one thing. Although I do know um, she was telling me that we were waiting for someone, mm -hmm. uh, and they were late, and she said uh, they were quite late. Ultimately, well, we wound up leaving without them. And she said, you know, Abe wouldn't have stand it. He wouldn't have stood for this. She said he was very punctual. He right. would give people 20 minutes. Yeah. And he, he did not, not suffer late people gladly. Okay. <laughs> that's, all, that's all he would give them was 20 minutes, and then he was off. Right. So, you know, just little things about his character and what, yeah. he was, what he was really like. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So um, let's talk a little bit about about the legacy of Babe, which is what this book is all about. And, and we had, I, I, I think I'd given you my idea about doing a book like this years ago uh, because nobody had ever really done it. There were many biographies about Babe Ruth and different kinds of picture books and story books and kids' books, but nobody's done something like this. And, and when, when I met people like Steve Tellefson, who runs the Babe Ruth League, which has you know, over a million players in it, and uh, Mike Gibbons, who runs the Babe Ruth Museum, or, or ran the Babe Ruth Museum in Baltimore for, um, what, 37 years, and people in the sports memorabilia collecting industry where he is easily the number one player, there are so many, so many uh, different areas where, where he endures. Uh, which is really unusual, I think, uh, for, for an icon. I was talking with a fellow who was the curator at the Smithsonian the other day. Uh, he's the one who put together the Babe Ruth exhibit at the One Life uh, series at the Smithsonian Washington. And, uh, and we had quite a chat about why Ruth endures. And this is a fellow who's an academic, a historian, and a scholar, and not, not a sports guy. Why do you think Babe Ruth has endured, and, and why do you think his iconic status seems to actually be growing you know, so many years after his death. Probably this, this, the, the single thing that lends itself to that is his, his personality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was his personality that, that he became known throughout the world. Largely, I think that be, it, it doesn't have really so much to do with baseball. Baseball is what got him there, but he, he carried the day with his, uh, with his personality. Uh, by all accounts, every um, every encounter with Bay, people remember him fondly. Uh, he was, and uh, Bill Jenkinson has talked about this. Yes, he was fun. He was a he was just fun to be around. Yes, people wanted to be around him. Yeah, and and you know you can we can talk about uh, we can talk about Hank Aaron and Lou Gehrig and you know other. Uh, uh, colleagues of Babe's who were, you know, near near equal in, in, in ability. Babe, Babe was this, is easily acknowledged as the greatest ball player, but these guys were no slouches. But they didn't have the personality to go along with it. Yes, I mean, Luke Eric was a shrinking violet. He 
Yeah. She gets the limelight. That's right. And didn't want to have anything to do with it. Babe, Babe embraced it. Yeah. And in large part, I think that's what accounts for his uh, his celebrity around the world. Well, I remember the afternoon I spent with Julia. This was a few years ago. I think she was a spry 94 at the time, uh, but still very, very sharp. And, and she told me a memory she had about uh, her, about Daddy. She calls him Daddy counseling Lou Gehrig that he should ask Colonel Rupert, owner of the Yankees, for more money. And, and uh, Gehrig seemed a little hesitant to do that. And, and according to Julia, uh, he said, uh, well, you asked for 40000 He was making fifteen or eighteen at the time. He said, but make it difficult for the Colonel. And Julia told me that, and she started laughing. But uh, the memory is you know, very vivid uh, in her mind uh, that he would... Uh, uh, you know, counsel Gehrig, and I imagine other players to do the same. Now, in the forward to the book, you talked a little bit about your work. You're an engineer, and you've worked in many countries around the world. And, and I'd like to ask you about this. Where in, in many countries where you may not think this is the case, you have encountered signs of Babe Ruth. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, probably the first time that I ran into Babe overseas was uh, in Thailand. I was uh, I was working in Bangkok and went to uh, went to a country club for lunch. Just took my wife out for some place nice to eat. Right. And uh, to my surprise, there was a, a pi- I recognized the picture long before I got anywhere near it because I'd grown up I'd grown up with some of these things. Right. They, they just kind of emblazoned in my memory. Yeah. But it was a picture of Babe with Jimmy Fox, and I could just ah. tell by the way they were standing what the photo was, but I couldn't believe it. The closer I got, I kept going, I couldn't believe it. And, and there it was. Um, and later on, uh, sometime later in the, I was in Bangkok, uh, in a restaurant and they had a picture of babe, uh, bowling, um, hmm. which was remarkable. And I'd <laughs> yep. never, I'd never seen, I had never seen the picture before, which was kind of interesting. There were pic- there's so many pictures taken of him. Yeah. Throughout his life. Uh, there's no way in the world anyone has ever seen them all. But, no. Uh, it's, it's always interesting when something comes up that you haven't encountered before. Yeah, well, you know, the, the picture we use on the cover of the book, and I had never seen that until a few months ago, and I was just immediately struck, uh, I was struck by this picture. It was taken of him in the Yankees' dugout in 1920, and he just looks like a, you know, a young, very powerful guy. Yes. Um, not at all as depicted in some of the films that have been uh, made. And it was a, a single signed photograph uh, that was sold. Uh, it was a framed photograph, a very large photo, and it sold at an auction in 2004 for $150,000. And the fellow who bought that uh, kindly gave us permission to use it uh, on the book, on the book cover. And uh, I just thought it was an amazing photo. And I, I'd never seen this photo before, but. You know, the fellow at the Smithsonian told me that Ruth was, Ruth was probably the most photographed person in America for, during his baseball career and uh, until his death in '48. Yes, he. Um, at the, I think a lot of these. Well, of course, you know what we went through uh, in trying to put photos together for for your book. Yes. In terms of rights and uh, permission. Yes. Yeah, it's not a it's not a, a, a straightforward thing, and, and many of these many of these photos, of course, probably the most famous the single most famous photo, Jerry, would be the Nat Fine picture that won the Pulitzer Prize. Right. Taken on um, Babe Ruth Day, nineteen forty seven. You know, it was taken from the back. Just yes, like, famous photograph. Yes. All, but the pinstripes and the number three is all you have to see. Right. You don't need to see his face. You know precisely. Yeah. Who it is what this is all about. Yeah. Now, Tom, you were the first person to tell me about this theory. We'll call it a theory about about Babe and why he never got to be, uh, was never hired as a manager. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. And I know we've talked to Bill Jenkinson and people like that. The idea that Babe was very progressive uh, in his barnstorming tours. He played against Cuban players, black players. He batted against Satchel Paige. And he did, did all this at a time of segregation in baseball. And I've talked to a lot of people over the years about Babe Ruth. And, and every individual just says what a wonderful person he was. And the day I spent at Cooperstown going through the um, Babe Ruth scrapbooks, 
you see all these photos you're visiting orphanages and and uh, hospitals and disabled kids and underprivileged kids and and the kids are in you know all colors all ethnicities all all every background you can imagine so he seemed to be a very open individual you had mentioned and uh, Julia uh, agreed that this could be one of the reasons why he was never hired as a manager because he was very progressive and baseball was dealing with segregation at the time. Right. Um, Bill J. Actually, I think a lot of my my, my initial um, exposure to that really came from Bill Jenkins and all his research. Yes, sir. He's probably Bill and, and Tim. Tim Reed is no slouch either. Bill is probably the most knowledgeable. Ruthian scholar that I, I know of. Mm -hmm. We uh, through our website, we uh, th th through Babe Ruth Central, we um, we take uh, questions and and uh, queries relative to Babe from uh, from people who you know who are on the site. And um, there will be they'll they'll ask. Uh, we we may not have the answer. Yeah. Uh, and Bill Jenkinson is particularly. Um, yeah, I mean anything relative to. To babe the ball player is pretty well out there. In a matter of fact, it's right. But it's, it's more things. Well, my my folks, uh, we went through the attic and found this item. Um, you know, it did, it, and uh, it dates back to such and such. Can you tell us anything about it? Right. Uh, or, or if there's anything that comes up, actually, before uh, before the Yankees, um, Mum's Mum's uh, recollection, you know, goes back to probably about. 1922 or 1923. That's oh. the earliest recollection of Babe. She was six or seven, yeah. Uh, anything that went down before when he was in Boston, she doesn't know anything about. Yeah. Unless it came up in conversation. Yeah. So there are times when we're just caught flat-footed and have no answer. Yeah. Bill Jenkinson is quite often one of the first people I go to yeah. to see if he can shed any light because he's just, he's researched Babe for so long. Yes, he has. His knowledge is uh, almost borders on the encyclopedic. Thing. Yeah, no, it is. You, you told me a story about uh, Bill Bojangles going into the Yankees' dugout. Yes. Um, somehow he and Babe were friends. I don't yeah. know. Or I don't know how. Yeah. Uh, that's not important. The fact was that they were friends, and I guess he was he was interested in uh, in seeing the clubhouse. So this was in the this was in the thirties, as best I can recall. And so Babe escorted him through the uh, the clubhouse and introduced him to all the ball players. Mm -hmm. And and the reactions ranged from shocked, uh, shock, uh, contempt, or how do you do? You know, some people were right. Some people were friendly. Yeah. Um, but to add to to do that, um, I don't think anybody could have just stepped up and have, have gotten away with that. But you know, Babe being who he was, mm -hmm. um, he was able. Uh, you know, um, Joe Lewis reached out to Babe uh, when he was um, he was training. Uh, you know, all the prize fighters they they have training camps up in the Catskills. Yeah, and uh, he invited Babe to come out and visit him. Uh, and what he wanted to do was just thank him for being just being just being Babe. And uh, I, you know, he wasn't a card carrying member of the NAACP or anything like that. Yeah. He, it just didn't occur to him not to be nice. Yeah. It didn't matter. And as far as playing ball went, we know he, he played numerous barnstorming games against uh, black ball players. Mm -hmm. I'm, glad that that, I'm glad that that took place because yeah. I sometimes hear, oh, well, we'll never know how good he was because he never played, you know, the baseball wasn't integrated. Well, I can point to those barnstorming games and say, yeah, we do know. Mm -hmm. and, he did, and he did, uh, as you said in the book, he did just fine, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> yes, he did. Well, I think it was uh, Buck O'Neill uh, in an interview uh, um, for the series on TV. Uh, uh, he talked about the time uh, there was a game and uh, Satchel Page uh, pitched to Babe, and Babe hit a home run that apparently went 500 feet, and uh, and they shook hands and talked after the, the, a kid retrieved the ball. And Buck O'Neill said that was one of his most memorable uh, 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 memories uh, of his entire baseball career was, was just watching that take place. Satchel was, uh, from, the, from the moment the, ball, the bat contacted the ball, it was clear it was going somewhere. Yeah, another planet. And, and, and Satchel Page was actually waiting at home plate to shake Babe's hand. 
Yeah. When he, uh, when he crossed the plate. Right. Yeah, that's quite a story. Quite a story. So, so what else are you doing in terms of the preserving the legacy of, of Babe? Uh, you, I know you represent the fa- the family uh, often. Um, uh, to do with uh, the Luminary Group, where they handle, uh, I guess, sponsorships, commercial endorsements, that kind of stuff. I mean, area, right. anything to do with the babe? There's nothing. There's not very much that seems to come by way of of, of Luminary in terms of um, appearances or yeah. uh, things like that. Um, actually, a, a, a point of contact. Sometimes, um, sometimes it comes through the website, but quite often. Uh, things come from through the um, museum because the you know the museum is out there in fairly in Baltimore. Fairly, yeah. For instance, uh, a request to fly over to Italy. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. for, for their All Star game, they have a vibrant uh, baseball uh, baseball professional baseball league in Italy, right. which a lot of people would not know. Yeah. Uh, but in 1914, they asked me. If I could come over and and say a few words and throw out a pitch at their All Star game, which coincidentally was the same day, uh, July of um, well, it was not, this was 2014. I can't remember the day exactly. Babe's debut, his professional major league debut with the Red Sox. It right. Was on that same. It was on that same day. Right. Yeah. But the it, it stems from um, uh, it was in Natuno, Italy, which is about an hour from Rome. It's on the coast. Yes. And it's very uh, it's very close to Anzio, which is where the Allies staged their invasion of Italy during World War II. And they uh, after the, you know, after they took the beach and uh, and took the territory, um, they, you know, they, they stayed to occupy the area and they they started playing ball. Right. And the Italian and the uh, the local inhabitants kind of picked up on it from there. And that's that's where it all started. Yeah, there's a, there's a great picture of a of a, a very you know John Wayneish looking guy. Yeah, held it on, and he's batting, and behind him there's a howitzer pointing up in the sky. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, things yeah things do come um, come from out of nowhere sometimes. Yeah. Didn't you also tell me that even when you were doing work uh, with for the U.S. military in Afghanistan, you encountered some things where. Babe Ruth was known, or was it in a... Just through, largely through conversation. Yeah. Uh, there were, as this was Afghanistan, so there was uh, a large expatriate population from all over the world. Okay, yes. And um, uh, my security people uh, were made up of uh, British, primarily South African, and some Australians as well. Right. Um, and I was quite surprised. And actually, uh, the, one of the Australian fellows, we were we were having a beer together, and um, a picture of Babe came up on my laptop, you know, through the, the yep. screensaver. Yeah. And then, then another one, another one, and then a few of me. And then he said, "What's that all about?" And so I told him. Yeah. Uh, I think it would make much of an impression, and to my surprise, it did. Yeah. And that was when I learned uh, learned about. Um, uh, the uh, their their greatest uh, the greatest batsman of all time in in cricket I, again I talk about this in the, yeah. in the uh, forward yeah it was uh, didn't know I didn't know this myself um, what do we know about pr- cricket yeah <laughs> the, the toughest thing with cricket is to stay away yeah. <laughs> well, I mean they go on for days yeah uh, but anyway um, the greatest batsman of all time uh, without any argument from anybody anywhere. Was an Australian cricket's very popular in Australia, along with rugby. Yeah. His name is Don Sir Don Bradman. Uh, Queen Elizabeth knighted him. Yeah. For his accomplishments. Yeah. And um, but and but the interesting thing is that uh, in Australia, he's known as the Babe Ruth of cricket. Of course, yes. So Bay, obviously Babe Ruth is meaningful to them. Yes. In Australia. Well, I, you know, they talk about Ruthie and this and Ruthie and that and the Babe Ruth of. Uh, I think Gene Krupa was the the Babe Ruth of drumming. I heard mentioned that Gordie Howe was the Babe Ruth of hockey, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. And uh, I think Ruth's name is used more than anyone else. Uh, it's just uh, it's mind boggling. I am told. I have, I haven't actually chased it down. I probably should. I, I believe that Ruthian 
is accepted lexicon. I mean, oh, <laughs> right. I'm, 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 I'm sure it's not in, Ox in the Oxford, but it, yeah. be, uh, it might be in Webster's. Yeah, well, that, 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 that is something, and uh, I come across that a lot, too. Well, Tom, I want to thank you very much for doing the interview today, and also I want to thank you again for all the help you've been with this book. Also, your son uh, Brent and your mother Julia, they also have been very helpful with the photos and, and, and all kinds of things. I can't thank you enough. So let's, let's definitely keep in touch and, uh, and anything more that happens with the, uh, preserving the legacy of Babe Ruth, I want you to let me know about it. <laughs> I'll be glad to. All right, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Jerry. Thank you. Bye-bye now.